again, control is absolutely necessary for perfection. But once you have perfection, the next question is priority. Um, the, and the priority rules follow what you would otherwise more or less believe. The, the, the depository bank as secured party has, you know, has control and has first priority. They may or may not give that away in a control agreement to set somebody else, but they don't necessarily have to. If in fact a third party, if we take the third way where the, the secured party is actually the owner of the account, that's kind of the best way but also kind of the most inflexible. Um, and notice also that these control methods really don't have a public notice component other than the fact that there's a bank involved in the transaction. You can deal with a debtor uh, and you know they have a bank account, but uh, even if you ask the bank do you have a security interest, they're not required to tell you. Uh, and you have to rely on kind of what the debtor says or, or the debtor does. Moreover, because priority goes to control and it doesn't have a filing component, uh, the, to use a, a 25 cent word, it's non-temporal. That is to say, control defeats any time if in fact you have a situation in which an inventory lender's proceeds winds up in a deposit account. Which is the, you know, the real prototype transaction right. where the, that, that could occur. And it could occur. And the debtor owes obligations to both the depository bank and the secured party. The depository bank has priority. Has had, say that again because it's the right. depository bank has priority regardless of when the deposit account was created. Mm -hmm. It could have been created the nanosecond before mm -hmm. the proceeds got in there. As long as they have control, they will defeat any other security interest other than you know, through the control. And there's rules. no filing system by where that inventory lender could have understood that to happen. Right? In, so in essence, you must assume that any bank account right. is going That's to be subject uh, to a security. So interest. they'll get subordination agreements or waivers right. or whatever it is in those circumstances. They my have guess, to watch the dollars. I mean, it's an interesting thing. They're going to follow the cash. Follow the right. cash. <laughs> my, my guess is, is that, I mean, I don't know if this is happening, but my guess is that uh, non-bank lenders of sufficient size will enter into master agreements with that various is banks. That, yeah. that is okay. happening. That was actually happening under former Article right. 9, mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, at, at, a, at a large level, this happens, although, I mean, this, 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 is a, this can be problematic in the non, if you will, the non everyday situation where you have a sale of a business and someone takes back a security interest to secure. Amateur uh, lenders. I mean, that's always have made the best cases anyway. Those have always made yeah, the, the best amateur, cases. The amateur lenders are going to have some problems with this. Right. Um, you, you mean the loans that are documented out of the law firm's corporate department. Right. right? <laughs> Ed Smith. The, the, I was going to say, I was gonna, there, there's too much there even to comment right. upon. Um, but once you get this, uh, again, the default and enforcement, uh, kind of the fourth thing I wanted to talk about is important. Uh, because here, the, the code says, um, in essence, if you're going to take a security interest, you'll be subject, if you proceed pursuant to that security interest, to the commercially reasonable rules under, under 9607. So you're going to have to, you can just take the money out, or, or yes, you don't really take the money out because it's an intangible obligation. You can just apply it and reduce the obligation owed to the debtor. But at the same time, there's an interplay with uh, set-off, offset, and the like, where the code is very clear that even if, uh, unless you have this third type of control where the secured party is actually the account holder, uh, a bank, a depository bank's right of set off is superior. Um, and the bank can choose, the depository bank can choose whether it wants to proceed by set off or whether it wants to proceed by enforcing whatever security interest that it has. So you have a situation here where from, I think, coverage to creation to perfection, banks really, depository banks in particular, have a particularly strong position, and that was more or less intentional throughout the process, as I understand it. Um, the Federal Reserve System wanted to ensure the free flow of funds through the system, and they more or less insisted on this kind of system in order to make sure there was no question that money was going to flow through uh, kind of the system. Now, how does this impact in bankruptcy? A couple of points just to make, uh, and, and then I'll go on to the consumer stuff. First, we've got about 10 minutes for your session. Okay, thanks. Um, there's going to be 364 issues because if every bank puts in a signature card, you got to give a security interest. You can't do that in bankruptcy without getting a court order. Moreover, you may have this as you kind of walk in. So you almost have to assume this may be an issue for the United States Trustee's Office, but you're almost going to have to assume that almost every bank is going to want to take this kind of industry standard or now industry standard a security interest. So that's going to be something you're going to have to kind of watch on an ongoing basis. Second, as I mentioned before, because of the definition of consumer transaction, you are going to get a lot of Chapter 13 debtors uh, who may, you know, the, the, the failed garage uh, entrepreneurs, if you will, um, 
who are going to come in with deposit accounts encumbered, and that may be contrary to their notions or expectations. Um, and how that kind of works through or how people wake up to that, to that uh, will be kind of an, ex an expanding notion. I mean, it'll be interesting to see how the rules of contract law in terms of what you thought you were giving kind of meet uh, the rules of Article 9. Uh, also in Chapter 13 is, as we all know, that uh, the crandon of a, of a residential mortgage, for lack of a better term, uh, is circumscribed, um, can't be done in many cases, um, if it's secured only by, if the mortgage is only secured by the primary residence. Now, if someone takes a blunderbuss or a, um, a shotgun approach and takes a deposit account, have they now, for purposes of the Chapter 13 Crandon statute, taken something, some other item of collateral, which means they put their home mortgage they, they, uh, you mean they should have a Chapter 13 form and a non-Chapter 13 right. form? Right, yeah, if you're going to file <laughs> Chapter 13, check here. Um, uh, so there's, there are going, or, or uh, there may be some problem. And the Chapter 13 cases are such that even if someone unintentionally takes it, they can't release it later on. In order so, to get the benefit of being In order to get the benefit be, of be, uh, be, being able to be crammed down. Right. So those issues are going to uh, come up. But the, the, the one that's going to be the most interesting in, in some cases is, and law professors love circular priority, um, is going to be the situation where, say you have a depository bank, an inventory lender, uh, both are owed money, and the depository bank, let's just say, is undersecured. And the, say the inventory lender is oversecured. Inventory lender sells goods, uh, the debtor sells goods, deposits the proceeds in the bank. Then they files bankruptcy. What happens? Well, uh, the proceeds rules are still there, so if we just looked at the inventory lender and the debtor, the inventory lender would clearly be able to trace the proceeds and would say, I've got a perfected security interest. The depository bank will say, I may be undersecured, but I've got priority over the inventory lender. Mm -hmm. um, and you now have this kind of weird circular priority because then the, the debtor will say, yeah, but you were undersecured. If you got a transfer within 90 days before bankruptcy, that's preferential. So I so want to. You think that the deposit into the deposit account would be a transfer? I think purpose. there is an argument, so. uh, both ways, as to whether or not that's a transfer. I mean, most of the law was developed in an area where the only thing you had to really worry about was set off and not right. liens. Right. Um, I think uh, the definition of transfer in the bankruptcy code is broad enough to bring that in. I agree. Uh, uh, the question is whether the, whether the deposit account. Um, it's the collateral, or whether it's the tr separate deposits going into the account that's the I, I've analogized, yeah. I mean, because a lot of times, for example, on receivables, if the receivables value increases, right. no one ever says that's right. a preference. You, you have get a more payments. Or you have a bunch of things about right. planting the seed and the crop growing during that period. Right. There. I mean, I mean, the analogy I is, is a bank account like a, a, a lump of gold that increases in value uh -huh. before you file, or is like a bunch of lumps, uh -huh. and they just gave you a couple nuggets not, ahead of time. I don't know. My bank account, when I don't put anything in, <laughs> 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 You know, Bruce, you started telling us a little bit about a few consumer things in the few minutes but, remaining. By the way, David, well, there's sorry, one point ahead. that we should sure. really mention here, okay. though, which is, I think, relevant in sure. bankruptcy to deposit accounts, and that is there is a provision that where, unless the secured party essentially blocks money coming out of the account, right. that when the debtor writes a check right. against the account, uh, the person who gets the check and gets free, the money right. takes free and clear, and I think that's going to be useful to bankruptcy attorneys, uh -huh. debtor bankruptcy attorneys who get their uh, retainer checks. They yeah, the free the transfer of money, because the there's a lot of law out there about tracking retainers and when it's, what, it's what the It's going to be are. very hard for the secured party to say that retainer check is my collateral. Right. Under prior law, all you had was some comments in 9306 that said if it was an ordinary course of business, of course it took free. Who knows what that meant. Uh, it's probably a reference to fraudulent transfer law. But Ray, now, Ray, now the, now the <laughs> that author is, didn't mention that in his article. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, but now the rule in, in 332B, 9332B, is, is that if, in fact, you're not in collusion and the money, mm -hmm. funds come out or transfers right, come out free. And, in fact, I think it will help in that situation. It may help in some other situations. But... But uh, thanks for bringing that okay, point. About sorry, five sorry about the sure. consumer stuff. Let's okay. go on. <laughs> uh, well, the consumers uh, is an interesting story. Now, as before, uh, in, in old Article 9, there were various consumer provisions, especially in, in the remedies provisions, and some of those carry forward. Um, there are special forms of notice you'll see in the 9600 series that consumers ought to get some safe harbor forms that relate to those consumer Those are default goods. provisions? Right, okay. default provisions. The consumer goods provisions. Because we haven't been able to talk today about right. much default areas, right. so it, but in the consumer area allows us to just right. touch on that and see where the consumer rules are a bit different. Right. Um, 
one of the things that's in the in the in revised Article 9 for commercial transactions is that there's a presumptive time of notice, a period of mm -hmm. notice that that does not apply to mm -hmm. consumers. Um, there is no consumer right of the waiver of redemption, although there is for other uh, commercial matters. Uh, also, a new thing under the code um, is for commercial matters, under certain circumstances, you can have partial strict foreclosure. That is to say, the secured party and the debtor can agree the secure party will take back some of the collateral and will assign a value to it, and that much debt will be extinguished on taking it back. That is not available. Specific for, for procedural rules for right. how they do the, that. About how not. an offer and all that sort of right. stuff. That does not apply to consumers. That's mm -hmm. only going to be to, again, that's not non-commercial, non-consumer transaction aspects. Now, there may have been more. There was going to be more or, or, or more consumer rules. And during the drafting process, and the people who were present can speak to it more, uh, so than I, who was not present, um, there there came, and, and this has been a, a problem, I think, in, in a lot of the UCC and uniform laws, there came to be looked like there was almost two codes, one for consumers and one for non-consumers. Um, and as these rules kind of uh, uh, piled up and piled up, it, it turned out that at one point uh, the consumer representatives, for one reason or another, thought that old Article 9 was better for them than revised Article um, and so in the process, in, fair, in, in a couple places, um, there was, there's a retreat. There's an, an exact and explicit notion uh, that consumer rules aren't even supposed to be handled or, or, or even supposed to be touched on. Now, two examples I want to talk of, and I'll, we'll put some slides up. First is in the definition of what a purchase money security interest. Important in bankruptcy for 522F purposes, also important. There are extensive rules uh, in 9103 for uh, when a, a purchase money interest can be transformed, when it has dual status. Now, if, if you can take a look uh, on the screen, 9103H says as follows, um, and this is after all these rules have been delineated, 9103A through uh, uh, G. It says, the limitation of the rules in subsections E, F, and G to transactions other than consumer goods transactions is intended to leave to the court the determination of the proper rules in consumer goods transactions. The court may not infer from that limitation the nature of the proper rule in consumer goods transactions and may continue to apply established approaches, whatever those may be. Did you say may not infer? Yeah, the jury should disregard the last statement. Right. That's right. right. <laughs> as, as I think Ed is called, this is the Wizard of Oz rule. Forget, you know, forget those, those commercial rules behind the... The, the, the curtain. That's odd statutory language to tell a judge what to do, I would say. It also, but it, but they re, it was so nice they did it twice. I mean, they, re, they, they, they repeated this language with respect to the rule with respect to damages for non-complying dispositions. For example, there was a split uh, between what people call the set-off rule, the rebuttable presumption rule, and the absolute bar rule. For commercial transactions, the rebuttable presumption rule has been made. But, but, Right. These are transactions where just to set the tone. Where there's been a default, there's been a, a, a sale, and now somebody's the sale has been determined not to be commercially, commercially reasonable. reasonable. And, and the question is, what what does a court do when that? Right. And these will come up in deficiency right. actions, right. Right. where the the, sure, where the the secured party will come in and say, I'm owed a deficiency sure. because the collateral wasn't enough to cover the debt. The response from the debtor was, Well, if you'd done it right, right. right. Um, you know, you would have gotten enough. Mm -hmm. The same thing we have the rebuttable presumption rule and some evidentiary indications in 9626, but 9626B, again up on the screen now, has the same kind of language that I read from 9103B, ending with, the court may not infer from, the, the limit, from that limitation the nature of the proper rule in consumer transactions and may continue to apply established approaches. Now, as you point out, this is very odd statutory language. This is statutory language saying, here's a whole bunch of rules, now ignore them, and go and apply either established approaches or or what? I mean, there's really very little guidance in the statute as to what appropriate differences for consumers ought to be, leaving this to be not only non-uniform, because it will be, uh, but also uh, making the lives for the people hearing uh, this broadcast and for Judge Hillman, I think, terrible, because there's no, there's no indication as to what the relevant standard is for such arguments. You're not real we're not real sure anymore how, you know, what, what's a good argument, that this is a consumer and they didn't know as much, or the rule ought to be different than consumers because the collateral's a different type. There's all sorts of arguments to be made that can be made, and I think 
Um, Judge Hillman was saying it's going to take 20 years. I think it's going to, this, this one is going to be permanently modeled. Well, this think. will be a very uh, interesting area because they've changed the rule for commercial transactions. You know, they've said it is, it is not the absolute bar rule. And they've said we leave it open for the consumer. So right. those are some interesting areas we, we need to, to, to move on. But we sure. really thank you very much for that. Yeah, excellent and the discussion. only other thing to add here is that although this is unfortunate, and I know the reporters in particular did not right. like those provisions, uh, there was no agreement. Right. And this was the only way. In this was a meltdown. This, this this was the only way to get revised. I mean, you see that in other places. I mean, mm -hmm. for example, in terms of the inability to to specify a tracing rule on proceeds, there are other places where Article Nine refuses to be uniform. Right. But you know, one thing that's real important in wrapping this piece is that, and we haven't mentioned this, it is truly extraordinary that Article Nine has been passed in all fifty states, right. and that really, and 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 I, you know, and I think one of the pieces is probably some decisions were made like that in the notion that consumer groups and others wouldn't have opposed. That, that, that's exactly right. Uh, it was a very pragmatic decision to uh, to get the benefits of the statute for everyone else. The good, uh, the good was not held hostage to the best. Right. Um, because of the many changes, particularly the new rules for where to perfect a security interest, the transition is a complex one. Ed Smith, you served on the drafting committee with Judge Hillman, so you're in an excellent position uh, to wrap up this program and to tell us about navigating the transitional waters. Well, yeah. I mean, how do you get from uh, to revised Article 9 from former Article 9? And Judge, you remember we uh, got to the transition rules last. <laughs> That's right. After 12 years yeah, of working, uh, of whatever. Uh, you know, my position is when you're drafting a statute, the stuff you get to last, you're tired, <laughs> you don't do it as well, and now we have the transition rules, well, which Ed can explain. <laughs> well, the, the, I, I think as well what, as they can explain. <laughs> It's not Ed's fault. Uh, I'll just be <laughs> thankful that we have 50 states that passed, even though we've got a few we, minutes. We, we, we have 50 states that passed, and, and we, we should mention that in four states, the effective date, the uniform effective date of July 1, 2001, was deferred to a later date. And so in Connecticut, it, uh, it's October 1, and in uh, Alabama, uh, Florida, and Mississippi, it's uh, January 1, 2002. And let's put aside for a second uh, the fact that we have these four states with deferred effective dates, because certainly on January 1, 2002, everybody will be online. Uh, what you're going to find is that there is a Part 7 to revised Article 9 that deals with the transition rules. And when you look at these rules, they are very skeletal. Uh, as you can imagine, with all the changes we've talked about, if we were going to be very detailed about the transition rules, the transition rules might equal the rest of the statute. So you find these skeletal rules, uh, but you also have uh, official comments, and the official comments are very helpful and instructive in understanding what these skeletal rules are. Now, I've been accused of saying that you should really read the official comments, and only if you find an ambiguity should you go to the statute. But uh, they could also move to your article because there's two articles that Ed and Harry Sigmund did that are truly extraordinary. Maybe they should be the statute. I don't know. <laughs> well, what we did was we tried to make it a little easier, a little user friendly for the practitioner. And you did a great job of that. Well, it was something that had to be done. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, July 1, 2001 has come. Right. And revised Article 9 in most states uh, has become effective. And one of the things that we all find is that revised Article 9 becomes immediately effective and even applies to existing transactions unless we find some sort of exception in Part 7 that says otherwise. So, so, so let me get this straight. If, in fact, I've got a foreclosure I'm holding tomorrow on our security interest that was created a year ago, tomorrow being in July of, of 2001, it's governed by new Article 9? That's right. That's right. In, in other words, you could do today the type of partial strict foreclosure that you were talking about if you comply with those right. rules under revised Article 9, even though that security interest was granted two or three years ago. Uh, and uh, the, only, the only real quirk here is when you have collateral that was outside of the scope of old Article 9 that is brought into revised Article 9, then you have a choice if you're dealing with a commercial tort claim, for example, uh, you can either foreclose uh, following the revised Article 9 rules or you can follow the clear, concise, uh, readily discoverable rules of other law <laughs> that told you how before revised Article 9 you can, con you can foreclose on a commercial tort claim. Uh, it will not affect, the, uh, of course, uh, litigation that's pending uh, on July 1, 2001. So let's say there was a lawsuit that was pending as to whether 
12 days notice was a uh, reasonable notice of a uh, foreclosure sale. Uh, one of the things we didn't talk about was that under revised Article 9, in a commercial transaction, 10 days notice is per se reasonable. So uh, you couldn't get into a situation where the defendant says, well, this is now per se reasonable under revised Article 9. That would be interpreted under uh, old law. Now, what, what do we do with those old security agreements uh, that were out there on those old deals? Because we've heard from Judge Hillman about these changes in collateral descriptions. So let's suppose uh, the secured party took a security interest in a general intangible that flips to becoming an account under revised Article 9. Does that mean on July 1, 2001, uh, that security interest now deattaches because uh, the security agreement doesn't reasonably describe the collateral? Uh, of course not. I mean, you have an official comment here that tells you that's just a matter of contract interpretation. A security agreement is an agreement. Article 1 defines the agreement as the bargain in fact of the parties. The bargain in fact of the parties was, of course, the fact that the secured party got a security interest in whatever was general intangibles at the time that the security agreement uh, was entered into. I'm more concerned about those security agreements that define Article 9 or define the UCC as Article 9 or the UCC as in effect from time to time because then there's the argument that the parties were allocating a, a, the risk mm -hmm. of a change of law which affected the definition. As a matter of their individual contract. Th that's right. exactly right. And so we look at this as a matter of contract interpretation. And I know a lot of uh, institutional lenders have gone back and they've really looked at their security agreements. And a lot of them are offering amendments right. to their customers, uh, <laughs> either in connection with other amendments or otherwise, to nail that problem. Now, uh, if we were. Uh, dealing with a security interest that was perfected by a means other than filing under former Article 9. And July 1, 2001, occur, which has occurred, and now we need to worry about whether that method is a permitted method for perfection uh, under revised Article 9. It may not be. Uh, we may find a situation where, let's say, uh, we talked about notice to a Bailey, that there was uh, notice given to a Bailey that's no longer a permitted method of perfection under revised Article 9. Does that mean that the security interest is now not perfected? Uh, well, no. You have a grace period of a year, a year to go out and either get acknowledgment from that Bailey in an authenticated record during that one-year period or to perfect by some other method that is permitted under revised Article 9. So if that Bailey was holding an instrument, let's say, and under revised Article 9 now you can perfect by filing as the instruments, the secured party can perfect by filing. And Part 7 gives the secured party automatic authorization to make that filing where it's continuing the perfection of the pre-effective date. Uh, financing scheme. And that's a one year grace, sort of grace, I'll call it a grace period or whatever. To, to, to perfect by, to, to get to it right perfect, under revised Article That's article. right. To, to perfect uh, under revised Article 9 where you have not perfected under former Article 9, or we have perfected under former Article 9, but you did it in a way mm -hmm. that wasn't effective under revised right. Article 9. It was and good in the old days and it's not good. That's now. right. And once again, we're talking about perfection by means other than filing, right. because when we move to filing, which is where most of the perfection action is, as we all know, uh, we have a few more complicated rules. Uh, the first thing to bear in mind is that all those old financing statements uh, that were filed before July 1, 2001, and that were effective to perfect under former Article 9, will still work for a while. Yeah. In other words, let's take a very simple example. Uh, let's suppose we had a debtor that had its chief executive office in New Jersey. Uh, the secured party back in 1999 had perfected a security interest in accounts by filing at the Secretary of State's office in New Jersey. Uh, but this debtor is a New York corporation. So on July 1, 2001, under revised Article 9, the place to fi perfect by filing is in the Secretary of State's office in New York, not New Jersey. We only have a New Jersey filing. Does that mean the secured party is unperfected on July 1? No. That New Jersey financing statement is still going to have life under revised Article 9 until the earlier to occur of its normal lapse or June 30, 2006. And June 30, 2006 is just a date by which we wanted to clear the decks to make sure that everybody had pretty much moved into the new filing system uh, and the new choice of law rules. 
So uh, <coughs> that does mean, of course, that if someone is lending to this New York corporation in, let's say, 2003, mm -hmm. uh, and searches in New York, and the search comes up clean, that that person should just not rely on right. the New York search because these old financing statements will still have some life for a while. That searcher is going to have to ask, at least for a while, where would I perfect under revised Article 9? Search there, New York. Where would I have perfected under former Article 9? New Jersey, search there. So what do you do when you got to renew this financing statement? Now, it's coming up for lapse. And let's suppose instead of this debtor being a New York corporation, it was a New Jersey corporation. So, you know, mirabile dictu, you know, you, right. you filed in the right place under former Article so they're, 9. They're, they're, under former Article 9, they were they're they're OK. And right. under revised Article yeah. 9, you would file in the same office. Right. So there's really no change in the place to file to perfect between former Article 9 and revised Article 9 in that scenario. You file a normal continuation mm -hmm. within the normal six-month window before lapse. Very simple. Now, what happens, though, if this is not the New Jersey Corporation, it's the New York Corporation. Now the New Jersey financing statement is coming up for lapse. Uh, the place to file is not New Jersey under revised Article 9. It's New York. How do you continue a New Jersey financing statement in New York? <laughs> and the answer is we have something fairly new and unique under revised Article 9. We have You file a new financing statement in New York. It's an initial financing statement. But it refers back to the New Jersey financing statement. It refers back to the date on which the New Jersey financing statement was filed, to the filing office, to the file number. It has a statement on it that that filing continues in effect. And the whole idea here is to make sure then that someone searching in New York mm -hmm. would find that financing statement and realize that priority mm -hmm. is claimed back by the secured party to the date on which it filed uh, the New Jersey financing statement. And the buzzword for this, the buzzword for this is uh, an in lieu uh, initial financing statement. Because L I E U. L I L I E U. Right. In lieu, uh, because it is uh, in lieu of the continuation statement that would have been filed in New Jersey if we had been dealing right. with a New Jersey corporation uh, instead of a New York corporation. Now, remember, we also have. Uh, as Linda mentioned, these requirements for filings uh, that are made uh, on or after July 1, that you need to have the debtor's name, the secured party's name, the indication of the collateral, and you need to have some other information to avoid the risk of filing office rejection. So when you do these continuations, whether you're doing the true continuation statement when we have the New Jersey Corporation or you're doing the in lieu initial financing statement when you have the New York Corporation, that's when you got to got to play by the revised Article 9 mm -hmm. rules. That's where you got to make sure that you really have all this information. That's where you got to make sure that uh, uh, you use the revised Article 9 collateral terms. So if your old financing statement had referred to general intangibles, which were now accounts, you got to be referring to the accounts when you do the renewal mm -hmm. uh, and play by the uh, revised Article 9 rules. Now, there are a couple of things about this in lieu initial financing statement I'll just mention very quickly, and that is that, uh, there, that when you file, when the secured party files that in lieu initial financing statement, the longevity of that financing statement is usually going to be five years from the date on which it is filed. So when it's filed in New York in 2001, that will have a five-year life from 2001. It has no relationship to the longevity of the New Jersey financing statement, which would have normally expired in 2004. Mm -hmm. Second thing is there's no six-month window to be concerned about in New York. This is a brand new filing. The New York Filing Office has no six-month window to police because there's no other mm -hmm. filing in New York. Uh, so you can file it outside of that six-month window. Uh, you can file it really at any time. And mm -hmm. a lot of lenders have been, institutional lenders, have been filing these as a matter of course, uh, well before their pre-effective date financing statements would normally lapse. And in that regard, then they'll have sort of a certain record under how, how their, their, their perfection under revised Article 9 in the right place, they'd have that date that, down. That's right. And then when it comes down to doing amendments and things of that sort, it's very easy to mm -hmm. do. 
There, there's another advantage, too, to this in lieu initial financing statement, and that is you uh, are not confined to just continuing one pre effective date financing statement at a time. I mean, you can have, the lender could have deals out there where financing statements had been filed in 40 states, let's say. So it could, if it wanted to, uh, continue all 40 of those financing statements if they were not filed, if they were filed outside of the state mm -hmm. in which you filed the in lieu by doing the in lieu initial financing statement. And then they could, and if they had to do an amendment or something after that, they would be, just be able to do it in the be, one jurisdiction? Be, be very easy. Be very easy to do. Now, we are filing, uh, finding right now that uh, these financing statements, these pre-effective date financing statements need to be amended. So uh, how do you amend these financing statements? Well, if a financing statement was filed under old Article 9 in the office in which you'd filed to perfect under revised Article 9, it's very easy. You just file an amendment in that office, whether they're changing its name, or you're adding collateral, or releasing collateral, or terminating, or whatever. But go back to my example now of the New York Corporation and the debtor with its chief executive office in New Jersey, and let's suppose that the debtor changes its name. Uh, and so now it's necessary to do a new filing that Linda talked about uh, to pick up after acquired collateral after four months from the date of the change of name. How do you then make that amendment? Uh, that's when you really got to do the in lieu initial financing mm -hmm. statement. You've got to do that in New York and make that change in the New York filing. Uh, you can't really go back to the New Jersey filing. And that was a policy choice. The policy choice really was we wanted to get these old filings moved into the right Article 9 file, the right revised Article 9 filing office at the earliest possible point. But we didn't want to do it in such a way as to disrupt people right away. We didn't want to make it uh, a, a matter of systemic risk. So the idea was renewals, amendments, those are the times when it makes sense to try to move the files uh, instead of waiting to the end of the uh, particular lapse period. So then we have priority issues, <laughs> which is, uh, well, what happens uh, if uh, uh, you took a security interest before the effective date of revised Article 9 and you were in a first position, and because the statute was enacted, you're now in a junior position? Well, how could that happen? I mean, it could happen in, a, in some crazy ways, but one, one, just to give one weird example, would be, uh, okay, you have um, a secured party who uh, took uh, a, a security interest in a debtor's uh, interest under a letter of credit, mm -hmm. as beneficiary under a letter of credit. And the old way to do that uh, under uh, former Article 9 was for the secured party, if the letter of credit was written, to take possession of that letter of credit. Well, possession of a written letter of credit uh, is no longer a permitted method of perfection under revised Article 9. What you really should do is get control of the letter of credit, which means to get consent from the issuer to pay the proceeds to the secured party. Now, suppose some other lender had gotten control. Uh, does that mean that on July 1, 2001, because a control interest beats a non-control interest, uh, that that particular lender wins? No. Priorities that were established before the effective date are not reversed merely by revised Article 9 coming into effect. Now, there are some very complicated permutations of these priority issues, but I think they're really more out there <laughs> in terms of mental gymnastics because most of the time secured parties are going to do the right things to protect themselves. They're going to file the in lieu initial financing statements that they need to uh, and the like uh, before this comes up. Now, we have the added complication of the fact that we have um, four states with delayed effective dates. And uh, a lot of people say to themselves today, and this does have some bankruptcy implications, uh, that, well, if my transaction has nothing to do with any of those four states when I close a transaction today, mm -hmm. why should I worry about former Article 9? Uh, well, the problem is this. Uh, let's just take a very simple example for a second. Uh, the debtor um, uh, is a uh, Delaware corporation uh, and it has goods that are located in Connecticut. Okay, and the deal is closing today. And Connecticut's revised Article 9 doesn't go into effect until October 1. So secured party would file a financing statement in Delaware that perfects a security interest in all of the debtor's assets uh, in which you could perfect a security interest by filing, uh, including the goods located in Connecticut. 
But what happens if that security interest is challenged in a Connecticut court before October 1? Uh, the Connecticut court is going to then look to its Article 9, presumably, uh, and its choice of law rules in its Article 9. That's going to that's gonna be the former Article 9 choice of law rules that says for ordinary goods, you need a filing where the goods are located. And I'm afraid that Connecticut court is going to say, well, without a filing in Connecticut, uh, you're out of luck. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, <clears throat> What if those goods were located in Massachusetts, uh, which has enacted revised Article 9? You don't have that risk, then, of the challenge in Massachusetts creating that result. But let's suppose the debtor has a subsidiary that is uh, incorporated in Mississippi, mm -hmm. and it files for bankruptcy in Mississippi before January 1, and it consolidates administratively the debtor with the Mississippi uh, filing. Now the Mississippi Bankruptcy Court, I think, uh, although Judge Hillman and I have gone back and forth on this, but I would think the Mississippi Bankruptcy Court would then look to Mississippi's Article 9 choice of law rules. What you're going to find is that Mississippi then still has the former Article 9, which says you need a filing in the place where the goods are located. That is Massachusetts, uh, and it's not the choice of law Mass rules in Massachusetts, it's the internal law rules, so you need a filing in Massachusetts. And because Massachusetts has revised Article 9, not uh, old Article 9, it w you don't need a local filing. You need a filing in the Secretary of State's office in Massachusetts. Without that filing, you're out of luck. So I think that for the stub period mm -hmm. until January 1, 2002, the most prudent thing for secured parties is going to have to be to perfect in the way that you would have under uh, former Article 9, in addition to perfecting under revised Article 9. Because you might come in contact with one of those four states that still has That's a tail right. period. If, if, if the security interest is challenged in one of those four states, you're going to have that issue. Mm -hmm. Great. So those are the bumps along Great. the road for a transition, but hopefully Great. when it gets behind us, uh, uh, past these, when we get past these bumps, uh, it'll be a more elegant uh, filing and system. Well, plus uh, all 50 states having passed it, even though we have this, this four-month period, I mean, we, we, we dodged a lot period. of bullets. So. It's a definitive right. period. Here's, right. a, here's an unfair question, Ed. Uh -oh. When can we forget about all the transitionals? What's the date after which we can toss all this stuff out? Well, you know, cer certainly when you get to uh, June 30, 2006, uh, except for, I think there are a couple states that have even tinkered with that date. <laughs> uh, uh, a couple states, I think, have postponed that date for another six months. But once you get past those outside lapse dates, uh, I think it's going to be pretty easy at that point to forget about former Article 9. That's something we can all aspire to in our professional lives. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, a lot of people then say, gee, I'm not going to need to worry about these local searches then. But you're still going to have to do the local searches because, as Linda pointed out, priority for goods, ordinary goods, is still determined by the law where the goods are located. So if you're looking for tax liens or environmental liens or judgment liens that get filed in the UCC records, those liens are not going to be filed in the office where the debtor is located for purposes of revised Article 9. It's going to be filed in the office where the goods are located. Uh, so you're still going to have to do those local searches. But I think generally, for your point, Bruce, I think it's this outside lap step. We're getting ready to close up. If I get any final comments, otherwise we're great. Thank you, Ed. That's our program for today. We hope you found it interesting and useful. I want to again thank our faculty for coming in to help us explore and explain these changes. And I want to again urge all of you to please fill out the evaluation form on our website and fax it back to us. For the Federal Judicial Television Network, I'm David Lander. Thank you for watching.